Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Welcome back to the show, um, dear listeners. And um, we are here at Access to Perspectives Conversation. And I'm very happy to welcome today Ross Burnaby, who is a professor of research ethics and research integrity at the University of Oslo, in Norway, and also an adjunct professor of medical research ethics at the University of Southeastern Norway. Um, with her expertise in leadership, Rose is dedicated to advancing research ethics and integrity in various contexts and also serves as a project coordinator of several initiatives, one of which we are focused on today, um, which is Rosie, the Responsible Open Science in Europe project. And um, other than that, Rose, you're also um, engaged in a um, project that all of which have to do with research integrity and inclusiveness to, to varying um, extents. And yeah, uh, but yeah, we will hear more about that from you. First of all, warm welcome and thanks for joining us today, Rose. No, it's it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation, Joe. Um, so yeah, let's let's get started in hearing a little bit. That's usually how we start the show to hear how you have um have reached the current position that you're currently in. A little bit of your a little bit about your scholarly background, and um yeah, and what you led to grow expertise and also now work in as an expert for research ethics and integrity. How did that come about? Yes, I, I, okay, just so just a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I, I, I uh, am a professor of research ethics and research integrity, but before being so, I did a lot of um, research on um, the ethics of, the ethics of um, medical research. Um, clinical trials, different phases, um, but also on the inclusion of, uh, for example, patients in the process of uh, of the governance of um, of medical of medical research. You now, so so th th that's how I started. I did, I did a PhD on um, um, uh, the ethics of phase four clinical trials, uh, and uh, this is so. When we talk about phase four, it's probably and uh, it's a it's a very exciting area when we talk about medical research because it's when when medicines are already out in the market but then you need to do research on them you know so it's not only about like um it's not just an, it's not an issue anymore of if it is it safe and effective but is it safe and 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 um is it safe and effective in the real world setting all right yeah, so, so when you talk like about a... real world then then we talk then 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 we talk about much more variables but also the possibility of more inclusion mm -hmm. but also um, um more complex ethical issues you know like um there are things that we can do in a clinical trial that we shouldn't do in a phase four and it was it was this it was it was this that brought that brought me to where i am now i mean you know this whole issue of inclusivity of uh, of justice has always been um, a question that I have been interested in. After working on the ethics of uh, of clinical, uh, working on phase four clinical trials, I moved into the whole issue of how of of how um, uh, medical research is governed in Europe. You know, looking into the role of regulators um, uh, uh, in in terms of oversight, but also how patient representatives, for example, are involved in the process. Mm -hmm. No, so so then, um, as as you can see, this can easily be <laughs> brought into the whole issue of uh, of um, well, what Rosie is all about, right? Of uh, doing research responsibly and doing open science uh, responsibly. What do you think makes us, from your perspective, your experience in medical and clinical research, 
Um, a question that I often discuss with participants in courses and and, and um, at presentations is why do we have to talk about open science today? And what are the constraints, um, some of which we are very much familiar with, like publication pressure, but also mm -hmm. what, from a cl clinical perspective, what is the open part of open science? And yeah. particularly with Rosie. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. All right, let's let's yeah. try. I, like I will also I know this this question is a bit broadly set, a bit broad broad set like set broadly. So, um, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, maybe we can dissect together. And so so when when we talk about um openness in medical research, and that's also, um, maybe I would say like twenty years ago, right? The, and up to the present, we're still talking about patents. And we know that patent thing means closing things, right? But then the whole issue of how of, of what can be opened in the process of clinical trials in spite of patents has been an ongoing discussion within the clinical trial field. Um, uh, so so the, the whole issue of um of of openness has been has been a shall we say a juggernaut, uh, an issue of uh, of wide interest, but also of wide contention of what should be open and what does openness mean? Is mm -hmm. it openness only in methodology or is it also openness in terms of products? Is it openness in terms of, um, is it openness in terms of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, provision of benefits to research participants? Or is it also inclusion of, of, uh, of patients, not only as research participants, but also, the possibility of them as 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 being called as researchers, mm -hmm. and if that is so, I mean, does this include bias? You know, so there, um, and 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 of course, this extends to openness of data. Is there is it possible at all to open clinical data, right? So so with with um with data, for example, from I don't know what a scoping review of of articles, <laughs> openness openness there is no question at all. Right, so it, it, it's very easy to to upload the data set from a scoping review of uh, based on 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 on, on articles. Mm -hmm. But if you talk about personal data, such as your your health data, say is 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 anonymity even possible? Um, and therefore, and and if you anonymize them to such an extent that you minimize really re-identification, will this still even be useful? Mm. Right. So, so when it comes to medical research, the, the these are these are, uh, shall we say, still very sticky questions. You know that uh, we're still dealing with, and also apparently need to be assessed on a project level, right? Like it yeah. cannot be generalized. Like we need checkpoints, as in like the fair principles for openness and reproducibility. Well, fair is for those who are new to to the terminology is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we come to talk about the re reusability aspect as well. Um, so it's about transparency, but also, like you said, we, at the same time, we need to protect identities and secure the data, and especially when it comes to personal data of patients and um, clinical samples that can identify an, an individual. Um, yeah. So, okay, let's 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 start with Rosie as a as the project that's been going on for the past was it four years? Oh, uh, well, three years. Three, the project was three years. Years, yeah, three year project, Horizon twenty twenty, um, and there the mission was to co create with related stakeholders another practical tools to foster responsible open science and citizen science engagement, um. So, but that was not necessarily focused on medical and clinical research, right? It was no. Just disciplinary. No. no. Yeah. So, um, maybe let's start with who was involved and engaged in the project. Like, who were the, was the consortium? And yeah, and then we'll talk about the results. What are the key takeaways? Or starting from the questions, which questions? led the consortium to dig into the topic and bring it together, citizen science with open science practices? Yeah, so, so the question was, um, so, so just to just to just to make sure that I understand. So you're asking how 
the consortium came about or is it like what well, what no, was who, the question that we're trying to answer or either way no like um who were the consortial partners in the yeah okay and then um how did the like the first year go about basically to to come up with the scope of the project and defining mm. the um the targets uh yeah the targets for um to to work towards the the results that we now have okay right so so consortium partners um so yeah so this was a project that was um coordinated from the university of oslo uh but within norway we also have the university of southeastern norway and then um, we have other partners, uh, such as, for example, the Finnish Learn Society is a partner. Um, uh, uh, we have Sarah's an office from France. We have the Austrian Research Integrity Office. Uh, uh, we have uh, the University of Tartu. Um, we have University of Porto. Um, uh, we also have the University of Latvia. We have EXA to represent citizen science. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, UREC to, to represent the Research Ethics Committee Network. Um, we also have, uh, um, uh, yeah, we also have um, National Technical University of Athens. Uh, and then I might be, for, I might be neg neglecting, um, uh, hold on, four, five, Six. Uh, yeah. So I. So yeah. So, so I might be. There might be some other <laughs> partner that uh, I'm neglecting now, right? So um. Yeah. No, so, can, so but. Yeah. No, I think you mentioned all that. Right. So, this is and yeah. Yeah. So so it's a uh, so we we have these partners and then um so we. At the first year of the project, of course, the first year is always the most uncertain, but also the most exciting year when we were exploring, um, even digging further, what are these ethical issues? Oh, but not only ethical issues, what are these legal, what are the legal issues, what are the societal issues, so on and so forth. Um, but also, what are the differences in terms of um, uh, preparedness for open science? Mm -hmm. you know in between in between fields across across disciplines but also um across countries within europe right oh sorry we also have um we also collaborated with international partners for example partners from kazakhstan mm -hmm. you know so um uh and um of course included the uh, partners from all over the world as part of our advisory board mm -hmm. So it's a Eurocentric but globally informed project. So yes, is... um, yeah. So so we were required to, of course, be Eurocentric. Mm. Yes, um, but at the but same I time, mean we this did... as a, I, I'm yeah, I meant that neutrally, not as a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I mean you know because then the money is coming from the European Commission, you know, so oh. that by default makes it somehow Eurocentric, mm. um, and this the and and we were um. Part of um part of the CSA call is really to develop a complement to the European Code of Conduct and Research Integrity again, Eurocentric in that sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but then we know that the impact of this will definitely definitely goes beyond Europe, right? Sure. Because when you talk about open science, then how how do we even delimit um the boundaries or borders of it, mm -hmm. right? So we have um actively included um stakeholders from abroad. In in our consultations, we included we included um, um, uh, colleagues from from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, you know. So uh, just to make sure that we're not producing something that is that is Eurocentric in a negative sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so that's even with the with the European partners is a lot to navigate. But was it? Was it clear, like basically? But let's let's focus on the on the outcomes or the path pathway towards the outcomes. So if if we look at the key results and takeaways from the project, which led to also a 
general guideline um, article or mm -hmm. paper that that you published um, with the team. Um, so yeah, what would you summarize with with a few sentences? What are the key takeaways? One and the other, and maybe a few words around how those were achieved. And don't worry about mentioning all of them because we're also linking the documents um, for further reading. But what's most important to you as a, if that can be summarized even as everything is of course relevant and oh, it's. Yeah, it's, it's, um... It's very difficult to summarize or uh, put our guideline in a nutshell, but but same time maybe I can indeed um, say a little bit about it, right? So um, uh, some some takeaways, you know. So so all right. So so when we talk about guidelines on research integrity guidelines, so talk about like um, some of the basic values, and 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 yeah, of course we take in. Uh, the base, basic values of the UNESCO recommendation on open science of ECOC, of of DORA, of FAIR, of CARE, et cetera, et cetera, of COARA. Right? You, you know, we take in all the, their fundamental values, but at the same time, what we need to understand is once you put all of these values together, you can always come up with, you can always have these values um, compete with each other, mm -hmm. you know, conflict with each other, right? So, so, so the whole, the whole gargantuan task of Rosie is how to number one, um, navigate how these values will um uh, will guide the different aspects of open science right and and how to provide guidance um in this navigation um uh so then that that will be that will be that will consist of the several articles within the guideline um now an essential component in drafting the guideline maybe one of the one of our one of our assumptions one of the well several of our assumptions or i think basic our foundations in the drafting would be the following number one when we talk of open science um we cannot just think of researchers right so that's why for example the guideline begins with uh, after saying that we agree with the different guidelines in 1.6 we say that national and European uh, policies conducive to responsible open science are instrumental in signaling to researchers and research performing organizations the political commitments to support and promote open science. We cannot have we cannot have responsible open science if we just um, put all the responsibilities on researchers. Right? Mm -hmm. There's there's a huge political governance responsibility to set the tone. Right and and the tone that's being set by um, uh, on a governance level will somehow define, you know, how open science will be conducted in Europe um, and and beyond, right? So so th that's one. This is a, this is this is a consideration of of equity, right? Mm -hmm. So um, as opposed to several other guidelines that that create a lot of de demands without specifying, the Rossi guidelines. Um, uh, try to specify as much as possible what are the responsibilities of the different stakeholders, um, 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 but also to set the tone by stating that, well, all of these things that we're saying here will be worthless unless we do have, uh, we do have this uh, political support for responsible open science. So I, I guess that's a, that's a, that's a very important, uh, one of the very important assumptions. A second important assumption is that different Different countries within Europe are also um, are are prepared for open science in different levels. No, that's We're not interesting. Oh, yeah. oh, like, yeah. can you give examples of where the differences lie? Yeah. So, um, uh, the, we have one publication, and I've I've um gave them the link to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're different. So. So, for example, if we if we um, there is a there, there is a report a deliverable entitled "Existing Policies and Guidelines on Open Science," and I have provided the link for this. Um, you know, so if you look into how many countries have a national public policy in open science and open access, you know, like uh, then then we see that just a little over half have it. You know, mm -hmm. and then if we look into how about national laws and open science and 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 uh, open access, th then the numbers would even be much smaller. You know, so um, when we published this 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 report, I think it was two years ago, only 
five of the 29 countries um, had national laws on open science and open access. You know, so that was, um, and how about national funder policy in open science and open access? Um, again, when we published this, there were more uh, national funders who did not have a policy in open science and open access than there were that had policies. Mm -hmm. um, so, so on and so forth. But then maybe we can also look into, for example, how um, they differ in terms of um, how many of these, uh, those that had um, a national um uh, uh, got national policies on open science and open access, how many of them mentioned FAIR? I mean, and we would be surprised that not all of them, in fact, mentioned FAIR. How many of them mentioned the term, even the terms research ethics and research integrity? Again, um, only not all of them, and actually few were actually mentioned ethics and integrity. Uh, how many of them mentioned the, the, the need for an infrastructure? Many of them mentioned that. Um, how many of them mentioned it's in science or had something to say about citizen science? Again, many do not mention citizen science over those that mentioned citizen science, mm. so on and so forth. You know, so so this somehow demonstrates how um, how nations within even within the European Union are variably prepared um, on a policy level, at least uh, on uh, for citizen, for open science. All right. Okay, so um, with the focus of Rosie towards citizen science, um, can we dissect that towards how does it diff or how does it relate to citizen engagement? Or did you agree within the consortium on a on a specific definition of citizen science in regards to open research? Like yeah, so so yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so citizen engagement can still somehow be perceived as some sort of um, um, participant engagement, right? So, um, but while citizen science um, 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 really has to do with ensuring that citizens are not only engaged in your research, whatever that means, whatever that engagement means, but all, but are engaged in a sp very specific capacity. Mm -hmm. That is a capacity as researchers in a research in a research um, activity. So right, collecting data and contributing to the to the yeah. data, data collection, basically. But even much earlier than that, even including them, for example, in the process of the of 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 um of uh of um how do you call this Project of uh, designing your research. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm um, thinking of the methodology, right? I mean, from even from the very beginning, it's not even just just uh, training them how to do the data collection, which we do, for example, to junior researchers, you know, but but also engaging with them, making sure that a research proposal, for example, is very much theirs as it is ours. You know, so so it so we saw citizen science as really seeing um the citizens who are involved in research as um on, on a on a very on a researcher capacity. Mm -hmm. So basically informed also for the scope, the benefits, the rewards of whichever capacity, and also um consulted um yeah. throughout the research um project duration. And then yes. in beginning to end um, up to yeah so so uh, and this of course has effects on on authorship as you've said uh, on mm -hmm. the benefits of research whatever that might be you know so yeah uh, and that's why it's so important to tread um to tread open science and citizens and science carefully Right, because we're talking about we're talking about really a new way of how we involve citizens here. If we saw citizens before as as participants, you know, <laughs> um, well, well, now we, well, we have I would say even a much deeper respect for them, not only as sources of data, mm. you know, but but uh, colleagues in their own right. But like, does not does doesn't being engaged or um. Yeah, being engaged in a research project also require a responsibility to act actively contribute. So what part of 
um, which what kind of citizens would would be considered. And then now the the extra challenges across all disciplines. And did you identify cases and disciplines or project types that would not fit that pattern? So in other words, is are the ROSI guidelines applicable without um, differentiation or like how do you say broadly to all across all disciplines and research project types? Or is it for a specific form of research that obviously engages. I'm asking this um, is a little bit of the devil's advocate question, but also yeah. at the end of the day, why do we do research? Like whose research is for a global society, which is made of citizens and researchers are also part of that group. Um, but now with a specific I mean, I'm also referring back to the UNESCO Open Science recommendations because mm -hmm. these explicitly encourage for an increase in citizen engagement. But then some researchers and research funders even would argue not all research is 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 kind of designed to actively engage citizens other than informing them about the output, which is often also a challenge in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, no, for, for sure. Yeah, so we we're not saying that all all um research projects or all all um funded projects should include citizen science, right? I mean, you know, so so one there there are several areas now where you see a lot of citizen science engagement, for example, mm -hmm. ornithology, but also but also a lot of um a, a lot of uh of activities from CERN, for example, now include citizen science, right? Mm -hmm. Or 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 um for or NASA, for example, now include a lot of citizen science. But also now we see a lot of research, for example, in the field of political science, um, include citizen science. Um, um, uh, some type of medical research also include now citizen science. So, so, and and how they're engaged would be variable, you know. So, um. Some really engage them as as data gatherers, you know, and others um, also also ecology is another booming area for citizen science, mm -hmm. right? And we can understand why because then um, we we know that there is something about local knowledge that scientists would not necessarily have, mm. right? So um um yeah so. So and and citizen science have been in, citizen scientists have been involved in these in these different projects in different capa or or in different degrees. Um, of course, the um, the most widespread of them would be citizen scientists as as gatherers of data, something like your junior researcher, mm -hmm. right? But in but in but in other fields, they're in they're more involved um, in in the way, for example, that we talked about a while ago, in the in 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 the in the in the in the creation of the proposal to up to up to being a co-author oh, okay. yeah so um uh so so in terms of in terms of in terms of of uh applicability i would say that there's really broad applicability mm -hmm. and if we think of the uh, if we think of 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 um, academic fields as four broad fields whether it's um natural sciences social sciences the humanities and the health sciences, we can imagine citizen scientists being involved broadly in those in four fields. fields yeah. but, but at the same time, at the same time, um, uh, for example, if a researcher is doing, I don't know what, uh, uh, um, uh, a, 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 um, a research that is that has single um, funds for this one researcher to reflect on, for example, the philosophy of Plato or mm -hmm. Heraclitus or whoever. Sure, yeah. Maybe maybe there's no no need for a citizen scientist there, yeah. right? Or and the same thing applies to um, um uh, mathematical theories, you know, where you probably need only one, two, three persons to make such um reflections on specific theories. Or yeah. think of I know I I have a colleague who calls it the um 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 uh, wish 
wish projects uh, referring to to projects that 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 cater to the fancies of philosophers for example you mm -hmm. know things questions that they want to explore and they probably want to explore it by themselves right. right so so the, yeah well citizen science probably not very relevant there right but, but yeah but I, I see where you're going with this because that's also something that i often ask especially in the in the courses that i give on um scientific writing or presenting. I work with the participants through a stakeholder analysis where we like in clinical research, it might be obvious, but where we like discuss in small groups also who are your actual stakeholders, not only as broad groups that you assume will eventually benefit from your research, but to make it as specific as possible. And then they often come up with groups that they haven't even considered, also by learning from other disciplines, um, where it's not common practice to consider certain groups like, I don't know, like patients or citizens really to benefit directly from a research output when you're studying nuclear physics. But um, if they then go through, okay, from basic research, what, what are possible applications downstream um, which, um, based on what has already been found in my field, then they quickly learn and, and also come up with, with stakeholders that they, again, they haven't considered before. And that also adds to the motivation in going to work every day in, yeah. in such repetitive and, and demanding yeah. um, environments. So it's, it's quite exciting and rewarding also for the researcher to consider actual human beings. And also within the family to discuss with family, friends, um, and make the research, which otherwise is quite detached from real world scenarios, applicable and approachable to your friends and family. So that's can yeah. that can be quite quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. Or I mean, like uh, so here, for example, in Norway, um, there's a citizen science organization called Migrant Citizen Science mm -hmm. Association. You know, so then now, uh, because like we talk about, we talk about, for example, citizen science in scientists in in Europe, but then maybe sometimes most of the time migrants feel excluded from that process. <laughs> so, so so now with the inclusion of uh, of such an association in research projects, so now we hear not only from from citizens. <laughs> right because of who who is a citizen do they mm -hmm. need to, have to be legal legal citizens you know but 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 also from those who have most of the time felt excluded in projects that actually affect um their well-being mm -hmm. right? so, so so there's really a lot it i think it, citizen science can be very powerful i mean it's a, it's the wrong direction to say citizen science should be include, included in all projects but at the same time um there's really a lot of, uh, as you've said, it can be very inspiring and also very powerful to to mm. to, to include citizen science and in, in projects that really matter to them. Yeah, um, a typical group to include as citizens in cultural studies is communities, and only even indigenous groups or indigenous peoples. Yeah. In yeah countries that are usually outside Europe. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. While we also have uh, communities and traditional communities inside Europe, which um well that's a whole well it's a it's a debate that's not often um ha had by people unless you're studying European communities. So um and there are a few guidelines but it seems that that, that I've come across and also with colleagues who are, and we are currently develop, or developing or collecting guidelines that exist for research engagement with communities. Do you see parallels or has this also been part of the ROSI project to engage communities um, when it comes to cultural studies versus citizen engagement of communities of certain groups in Western industrialized societies. So um, if we have explored, so the question is if we, if part of the ROSI project was to explore differences in terms of engagement 
in in terms of um yeah, I think the societies, that I for have, example or and I'm not sure if there's an answer to that so um is it what like what different types of communities exist when it comes to citizen science and what kinds of or, or yeah, it's... often like any individual who considers yeah. themselves as a citizen as referred to a research project um, uh, this is a whole community or group of people within a society yeah but because well yeah so def, I, I guess i agree with you that there's no one answer to it yeah. because even <laughs> Even those of us who are researchers can be citizen scientists, right? So, for example, mm -hmm. I do a lot of research in, within the field of medical ethics, right? Medical research ethics. But if, but if I but if I will be but if I will be acting in my capacity as someone who lives in this particular area in Norway, you know, looking in looking at like which birds are present at which time, then I'm obviously not acting as a scientist. I'm obviously acting as a citizen. Mm -hmm. because that's that's not my area of specialization mm -hmm. and also and and how many permutations of that can we make <laughs> mm -hmm. right so, so i i i guess we can only broadly talk about um uh, uh groups of people you know so we talk about for example um aboriginal people as opposed to those who are not people of a specific color in a in, in a country and those those without without such um 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 uh, 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 with, with, well who are not considered colored and so on and so forth people of specific ethnicity you know but, but we can but but as i said anyone and everyone can mm. have the potential to be a citizen scientist now i'm i'm, I'm of course thinking while i'm saying all of these things yeah. you know it's like because because one thing about open science means also means also means epistemic justice Right mm -hmm. means opening our what we mean by knowledge beyond what we defined as knowledge earlier, you know. So we're opening ourselves to new knowledge systems. Right. And and if we if we think of citizen science and open science in that direction, well, <laughs> what limitations do we have in 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 categorizing who is a citizen mm -hmm. scientist and who isn't? Right. So, 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 and because it's so broad right now, as uh, as we stress, for example, in the Rosie guidelines, it's very important that we do this in a very systematic fashion, but also in a very with with a with a very equitable spirit and giving some responsibilities, for example, on the side of the academic researcher or the institutional researcher, you know, to make sure that uh, citizen scientists are are included properly, but also but also train properly so that we, we don't, well, yeah, we don't, we don't um, uh, uh, replicate bad practices of inclusion of citizen scientists because it can also go in a very wrong direction. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so I, I don't think we can come up with categories or give like a list of categories. It's, it's quite difficult. I think um, yeah, it's probably also, again, very specific to uh, the research scope. And who's yeah. involved in the research, as in yeah. practicing researchers, and what the research questions are, and then who to consult exactly. as citizens. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. It's complex, but I think also always when when we consider the 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 project level, it can be quite clear. It's like, like with the fair principles. There's a lot of conversations about the fair principles on the meta level, and all the stakeholders except the researchers agree that fair principles must be um, applied. But then the descriptions and what fair means are so broadly defined that for yeah. a researcher who's, who's now exposed with, oh, you have to do, you know, make a data fair. It's like, that's also a question I often get when I introduce fair as a concept. It's like, okay, but I don't know how that applies to my data. Like, and then we have to actually sit down and and you know work through the whole process and assess what data types did you collect, how much of yeah. it, um, what different formats, um, is that even publishable? Why has it been archived so far? Is it is necessary to anonymize the data, as you said in the beginning? Like there's so many components, it's it's quite complex but necessary. And at the end of the day, like my tag and how I introduce open science usually is 
we're talking about good scientific practice and research integrity and every researcher i assume we all want to comply with it like we like most if not all of us have the best yeah. intentions why is that so difficult that's an open question <laughs> well yeah, there are several pressure points first of all it's also complex then we have this publication pressure you mentioned the necessity or you highlighted from the from the guidelines that that came out of the rosie project um that the incentive system is key to enable researchers to practice open research in the first place and for that we need to ease the publication pressure but still hold each other accountable um, and one way to achieve that is through fair data um, processing of it, making the research data fair and engaging for various stakeholders, including citizens, to yeah. various extents or various, um, yeah. And then the researcher carries still a lot of responsibility, but also has a unique position in exploring a new field of knowledge. But then the responsibility is who, like now that if we have this knowledge, who can benefit and how can we protect from ourselves and others from possible yeah. harm that comes out of that knowledge? Like that can basically, how can, if, if the research can possibly be misused by, and when we look at um, research or basically data security, um that individuals be harmed or like we've seen if if certain um, political actors get hold of of military research data then they you know that that has whole other consequences <laughs> which actually affect um peace or um well-being in certain parts of the world um, so there, there are quite some implications that, and the question is like, who carries the responsibility? I, like, I hope it's not only the researcher, but the researcher has probably the widest possible knowledge about a research topic that they're exploring. Who carries um, the responsibility for? Yeah, for making assessments for reuse and um mm possible harm out of mm. sharing the research as much as we want to make our research outcomes accessible there's also the danger of misuse through yeah. reuse for sure but but is it isn't that that i mean so one thing when we talk about so when we talk about who's responsible you know for ensuring fairness mm. i guess <laughs> right so um I mean, he, he, the, uh, one thing about open science is we also create new jobs for 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 because then, yeah. who safeguards fair? I, I mean, now we're talking about different actors safeguarding fairness, mm -hmm. institutional or otherwise, right? So it's not just the researcher now. We're yeah. talking about different actors now who safeguards fairness. Mm. Um, so definitely the researcher still, still has some kind of a leading role in making decisions there, but when it comes to safeguarding FAIR, I mean, <laughs> now, now there's really, yeah, we talk about infrastructures, we talk about new jobs, mm. you know, to ensure that, data, right? So um, data managers and data security officers and in some institutions these already exist and it's a matter of capacity and funding opportunities but also is a research topic even so prone to bring about threats to society and most research I would guess and hope is not so in most research uh, activities we're pretty much safe and those that carry certain threats um, can then, through also the FAIR principles, by applying FAIR principles and assessing um, possible threats and make, making risks, risk assessments of, some, of, of any sort, um, mm. the security measures in place. But it all yeah. comes down to what, what Rosie and other open science initiatives is all about. We need a certain level of transparency and also accountability to be able to make these assessments in the first place. 
to yeah, benefit but, but, we need real structures you know to make open science really responsible I mean, like, yeah, and on the one hand, we now have a lot of infrastructure, as you said, and different sets of people, whether it's a data, a data protection officer, so on and so forth, you know, but but there's also, as you've said, there's always the persistent you, uh, uh, risk of dual use, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I guess this is bigger in, uh, in some fields than others. So think, for example, of the natural sciences, you know, so there's always some some studies would really, you know, some fields would really have that much bigger threat. And who's safeguarding that? Mm -hmm. um, so if we, if we, uh, we have all experience applying for grants, right? And one of the questions, one of the ethics questions is, is there the risk of dual use? And this is just a declaration, yes or no. Mm -hmm. So if you put in no, um, will there be second, third set of eyes that will ensure that there's really no dual use risk? of the research right so so it, it becomes but that's also and what, whose responsibility it is to do that and isn't that also what peer review is there for to to identify potential risks where the act like acting researchers have not seen those or disclaimed those there's also a matter of peer review and where open science and open peer reviews applied the community at large or wherever mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. anyone has a chance of flagging researchers potentially potentially risky and then it can be withdrawn if need be so there's also yeah but but this this when it comes to inclusion of the community in the process at least what we have now community inclusion comes at the end like for example, in publications, mm -hmm. or when when research products are already out somehow in the open, mm -hmm. um, but 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 at certain instances that can already be too late, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you talk about dual use, you know. So dual use needs to be um, the oversight of that really needs to begin at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. It can't be not when there are already research products to talk about. You know, so um, um, so on the one hand, we we already have a lot of structures, and we said different countries have different degrees of robustness in terms of structure infrastructure, in terms of uh, in terms of specialists or or uh, um. On the other hand, there are there are real issues that should go beyond um the national level. Mm -hmm. So when you talk of dual use, this cannot, uh, especially if it's funded by, for example, by the European Commission, um, it goes beyond um, individual national interests, right? So because then that can be a risk um, mm -hmm. that goes beyond um, just the citizens of one nation, you know. So uh, yeah, yeah, and and who's 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 safeguarding that? Um, how is is open science even like a, the sufficient safeguard for for something like this? Mm. So, yeah, I think. Well, let's hope it can be. <laughs> um, it's very advocating, but um, I think we we agree that as much as openness is is key, uh, at the same time also um, accountability and security and safety. Is of course um, goes hand in hand, and um, the more stakeholders involved, the better we can take care of of all aspects to consider. Yep. And the more standards are developed and um, tested in whichever regional, national, and and global applicability, um, leaving room for flexibility and adapt adoption adaptation being adapted to specific use cases um so i think we're we already have something to for like to to revert back to in each research discipline and there's also um opportunity to explore and develop further and that's the exciting part about the research um, process in the first place um I, i'd like to like maybe with two or three sentences what's next after Rosie, that's now coming to an end as a project, is there plans for a second iteration of the project or continuation in a similar setup? Or what's what's your yeah. next next adventure? Yeah, so so um Rosie ended like end of February. 
So um, but the work of Rosie is far from is far from it being ending. <laughs> yeah. So because um, we do have many other things that we that we that that we promised to ourselves we will accomplish beyond the deliverables we have mm -hmm. stated we will deliver. All deliverables have been delivered. But at the same time, we're still working on. So there's what there, there, we have training materials on responsible open science, you know, and and these are um, openly available in the Enary classroom and the Rosie Knowledge Hub. We also have a Knowledge Hub, um, but then we still are developing number one a MOOC version of the training materials. So our training materials are divided into different fields, plus also one for citizen science. Now we're developing the MOOC version of that, so that's uh, that that that's uh, that should be coming maybe hopefully by the end of this year. Um, we also have like the Rose uh, the Responsible Open Science ebook, mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe also hopefully that comes in if not uh, late this year, early next year. You know, um, uh, as you know, we were present in the Parliament, so this whole push for Responsible Open Science will continue in different fronts. Yeah. Um, Alea just um, uh, confirmed to us that they are endorsing the ROSI guidelines mm -hmm. and that will also entail some work, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, um, yeah, <laughs> in, in terms of uh, not only for pushing for um, uh, uh, more use of, of our guidelines, but maybe in the future also the process of you know, any guideline should be, any relevant guideline should be a, li should be a living guideline. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to talk about like um, the process of revising, for example, the ROSI guidelines after a few years, so on and yeah. so forth. So the, the the work of ROSI, even if the project has ended, uh, the work is really far from finished, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and uh, of course we hope to, to, to um, continue doing our work with funds, yeah, um, in the future. Um, but, but yeah, but, but for sure we will be, um, this is, yeah, you will still continue to hear more of, um, the responsible open science work. Yeah. From us. Thank you so much for, for the conversation on the insights and also for putting all the work with the team into the Rosie project and the outcomes in the guidelines. Um, we will of course share any, um, the reports and materials that, and the toolkit, um, as they uh, are released with with the network and possibly also do a follow up conversation as they as on upon their release to introduce and yeah thank you so much and all the best for for the next stage yeah thank you very much sir always a pleasure <laughs> thank you thank you thanks for joining us to listen to this episode do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.